In what appears to be Democrats' final surprise before the election, a woman has come out and accused President Trump of sexually harassing her 31 years ago in the presence of precisely one eyewitness who conveniently happens to be dead. We will examine the super duper serious allegation and what it means with only 11 days to go. I'm Michael Knowles. It's The Michael Knowles Show. Welcome back to the show. It is now illegal to pray silently in your own head in the United Kingdom. Uh, It's now illegal to wear t-shirts that defend life in your own home in certain places in the United Kingdom. We'll get to that in a moment. First, though, I want to tell you about Birch Gold. Text Knowles to 989898. You do not have much control over the outcome of the election, but you control the protection of your savings by diversifying now into gold from my friends at Birch Gold. Gold has stood firm in the face of greedy governments, economic upheavals, and global strife. It can protect you now. Birch Gold will help you convert an IRA or 401k into an IRA in physical gold. And the best news doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. Think about this. In the past four years, the buying power of the U.S. dollar has declined. The price of gold has increased 40%. Coincidence? I got to tell you, folks, I have a decent part of my portfolio in gold. And uh, this week in particular, I've been happy about that fact. <laughs> so you ought to text Knowles to 989898 and get your free info kit on gold and diversify. As the exclusive gold partner of the Daily Wire for the past eight years, you can trust Birch Gold, as I do, to protect your savings. Text Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, to 989898 today. Uh, go check it out. No, no reason not to get information. If you'd had this information some years ago, uh, maybe you'd be even happier. Text Knowles, Canada View LES, to 98, 98, 98. Before we get to any of those things, a, a, an egregious and outrageous a betrayal from a top Republican. I don't know how else to put it. I have defended cocaine Mitch McConnell many, many times over the years. I think he's done good things. I have always given him the benefit of the doubt, pretty much. This is, this is a betrayal that is really hard to wrap one's head around. A uh, piece just came out from CNN yesterday. Headline, McConnell says, quote, MAGA movement is completely wrong and Reagan wouldn't recognize Trump's GOP. This is a dozen days before an extraordinarily consequential presidential election with Senate elections up, with House elections. You've got got Senator Cruz on the ropes in Texas because Democrats have poured a ton of money and a lot of foreign nationals into Texas. And this is what you come out with. You're the the Senate majority leader. You come out with the MAGA movement's completely wrong and Ronald Reagan wouldn't recognize it. What else did he say? I think Trump, this is according to Uh, a book written by an AP reporter that I guess has has been leaked conveniently right before the election to CNN. This is what what McConnell supposedly told the reporter. I think Trump was the biggest factor in changing the Republican Party from Ronald Reagan viewed, and he wouldn't recognize it today. Trump is appealing to people who haven't been as successful as other people and providing an excuse for that that these more successful people have somehow been cheated and you don't deserve to think of yourself as less successful because things haven't been fair. He said, unfortunately, about half the Republicans in the country believe whatever he says. I'm not at all conflicted about whether what the president did is an impeachable offense. I think it is. This is, of course, when this goes back to when McConnell was uh, attacking Trump uh, during during one of the two impeachment uh, proceedings. According, apparently, Mitch calls Trump a, quote, sleazeball, a narcissist, not very smart, irascible, nasty, just about every quality you would not want somebody to have. I'm not, I'm not going to keep reading it. You can read the article if you want. You can read the book if you want. Here's the first thing I want. I want Mitch McConnell. This is what I'm hoping for. I hope Mitch McConnell comes out and says this isn't true. I didn't say these things. I hope it's I hope it's fake news from CNN. Could be fake news from CNN or the Associated Press. They run fake news all the time. So I want so I'm chief. My chief hope is 
in this story, McConnell comes out, he says, it's just not true. If it is true, I don't, I don't know, I don't know how you could possibly defend it. McConnell could say, well, I gave the interview earlier. You gave the interview earlier in an election year and you didn't think it would be trotted out right before the election. Even if, even, even if you did give it earlier, you're going to throw all your guys under the bus like this? For, for what? On top of M- McConnell's terrible behavior during this election cycle. Let's not forget that Mitch McConnell's super PAC has, has undermined Ted Cruz in Texas. They've been withholding money. This guy's supposed to be the leader of the Senate, the Senate Republicans. He's been withholding money from Ted Cruz, a, a, a race that Democrats have been pouring money into. Ted Cruz, one of the best senators we've had in my lifetime. Uh, in a really important race, you're, you're going to allow Texas to flip blue? Why? Because Ted's too conservative for you? You don't, you don't like Trump because Trump's the head of the Republican Party now and he's made it more conservative in many ways? I don't, I don't know what to say about this. Rick Scott, he's uh, the Mitch McConnell super PAC's been withholding money from. Rick Scott, because what? Because he's a little too conservative? This is really bad stuff. Uh, at this point, look, Mitch has done some good things. I'm grateful for the good things. He held up the vacancy for Scalia's seat, and that was really important. That was great. Thank you for it. He's got to go. He's got to go. This, with Republicans like this, who needs Democrats? Th- this is, it's, it's a reminder of a fact that a lot of Republicans don't want to acknowledge. There are Republicans, disproportionately in party leadership, there are Republicans who want Trump to lose. There are Republicans who will feel better on November 6th if Kamala wins than if Trump wins. There are Republicans who want Ted Cruz to lose in Texas, who want Rick Scott to lose, who want some of these more contested races to go to the Democrat side rather than to the conservative Republican side. Mitch has to go. I know he's going to step down 25 years from now or something. (laughs) Remember, he he had his his retirement announcement. He said, I'm I'm stepping down in about 2052 or something, you know. In January? No, that's too far ahead. And then for the Republicans who are vying to replace him, I don't know exactly who's up for it. I'm not uh, not a member of the U.S. Senate. According to news reports, it's people like John Thune. It's people like John Cornyn. I think John, it's only Johns are running to replace Mitch. Uh, John Barrasso was in it. I think he said he's not going to run for it. So, okay, well, you've got John Thune, John Cornyn, whoever else is, is looking at it, maybe Rick Scott. Uh, we need clear statements from them. Mike Lee called for this just yesterday. We need clear statements. This is completely unacceptable uh, behavior from Mitch McConnell. Mitch has to go. That's it. Uh, Mitch McConnell seems to, it, it pains me because I like cocaine Mitch. Or I've, I've, I've supported a lot of things he's done over the years. He's probably not the most rock-ribbed uh, conservative. He, he, he undermines conservatives sometimes, but I think he's been basically effective. This is, this is such a profound betrayal 12 days before an election. I just don't see how you get over that. He's going further than many Democrats are in, in helping Kamala and the Democrats here. You know, the Washington Post, left-wing establishment paper as ever there was, the Washington Post thus far has not endorsed Kamala Harris. You remember the LA Times has come out and actually said the LA Times will not endorse Kamala Harris, which is a pretty big deal. The libs are trying to spin it and say, oh, it's just because the LA Times has new ownership. So, So a new person bought the LA Times in 2018. That doesn't explain it because, because the LA Times endorsed Joe Biden over Donald Trump in 2020. So if you're trying to argue that the LA Times is somehow a right-wing paper, which is absurd, uh, well, how do you explain 2020? They endorsed Joe Biden over Trump. They're just not endorsing Kamala Harris. Why is the Washington Post not endorsed Kamala Harris now? Oliver Darcy at CNN, a very, very liberal journalist, Oliver Darcy is, is furious about this. He wrote a piece on his blog, a puzzle at the Post. With less than two weeks until ballots are cast in November, the Post has remained conspicuously silent on the highest stakes election in recent memory. Why? Why is the LA Times explicitly not endorsing Harris? Why is the Washington Post not endorsed Harris yet? Why are people holding back? Why did the Teamsters not endorse Harris? Why are, why are so many places that typically go for Democrats not endorsing Harris? Two explanations, not mutually exclusive. It could be both of them. The one explanation a lot of people think that 
Trump is going to win. Things are looking good for Trump, and they don't want to get on the wrong side of that. But even in elections that look like they're going to go for the Republicans, very often the tried and true, died in the wool libs will will endorse the Democrat. So what's the second explanation? I think this is the more plausible explanation. Because it looks ridiculous to endorse this woman. This woman is obviously unfit to, to be president. She doesn't know anything. She's, she's not popular. She's never won a single vote in a primary while running for president. Every time she speaks, her, her approval numbers go down. She loses votes. It's ridiculous. And it makes you look ridiculous to endorse this woman. It doesn't make you look ridiculous to endorse Biden in 2020 or even Biden in 2024. Sure, he's, he's got dementia and everything, but he's still, he's proven himself in national politics. The guy has staying power, okay? The guy has gotten things done. I'd say for better or worse, it's mostly for worse, but at least, you know, if you're a Democrat, Joe Biden's a serious person. Kamala Harris is not a serious person. Even, even from the standpoint of Democrats, it just looks ridiculous to endorse her. And so many people are not. Now, Kamala has made herself look even more ridiculous over the past 48 hours. We'll get to that in one moment. First, though, I want to tell you about Home Title Lock. Go to HomeTitleLock.com. Use promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. This is a real call out to all American homeowners. You already do so much to protect your home. You might not be aware of a hidden threat, and that is title theft. Homeowners nationwide have over 32 trillion dollars in equity. That's an all-time high. With everything going on in the state of the U.S. economy, home ownership is more challenging than ever. Title theft, just one thing you really should not have to worry about. That is why you need protection from the crime the FBI calls house stealing, where the equity in American homes is the target. If your title is not being monitored, scammers can transfer it into their name, take out loans, and your equity could be wiped out without you ever knowing. The best way to protect your equity is with Triple Lock Protection from our friends at Home Title Lock. Triple Lock is 24-7 monitoring alerts and restoration services. The first step is to check on your home's title to make sure that you are not already a victim. You can get a free 30-day trial and a free title history report when you use the promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, at HomeTitleLock.com or use the link in the description below. HomeTitleLock.com, promo code Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S, for 30 days of protection and a free title report. Kamala Harris just sat down for an interview on NBC News. Once again, a friendly outlet. She was once again asked really simple, basic questions that even the liberal outlets have to ask her if they want to maintain any facade of credibility. And Kamala Harris once again totally flubs it. Can you say that you were honest with the American people about what you saw in those moments with President Biden as you were with him again and again repeatedly in that time? Of course. Joe Biden is a, an extremely accomplished, um, experienced, and, um, and, and capable in every way that anyone would want if they're president. And you Absolutely. never saw anything like what happened at the debate night behind closed doors with him? It was a bad debate. People have bad debates. Should he, that, he is absolutely... But that's the reason why you're here, and he's not running for the top of the ticket. Well, you'd have to ask him if that's the only reason why. What do you think? I am running for president of the United States. Joe Biden is not. And my presidency will be about bringing a new generation of leadership to America that is focused on the work that we need to do to invest in the ambitions and aspirations of the American people. Okay, okay. She still doesn't have an answer. This, is the, this is, should be the first question she has an answer to in her campaign because it's a question about why she is the nominee. This should be the first thing they figured out. They still haven't figured it out. It's 11 days until the election. Why can't she come up with an answer to this? Because either way she answers, she looks bad. So Kamala is maintaining... Joe Biden is capable in every single way. And then good on the reporter. She goes, oh, well, if, <laughs> if he's capable in every single way, why are you here? Why are you the top of the ticket? Why was there a coup that undermined what all of the Democrat primary voters voted for just about and put you there, someone who's never gotten a primary vote while running? If, if Joe Biden is capable, Kamala Harris should not be the nominee. If Joe Biden is not capable, 
then Kamala Harris needs to answer for why she covered up his dementia. But either way, she's done something wrong. Either, either way, it doesn't look good for her. So you might ask, all right, if you're Kamala Harris, if, if you just want to answer that question, your answer should be, yeah, Joe is slipping. He's in mental decline. That's why we saw it at the debate. It was so obvious to everyone, and that's why they replaced him with me. And then the follow-up is, well, when did you first notice that he was in decline? And she, she would say, I, you know, I, I didn't have a lot of FaceTime with Joe. I didn't see in my meetings with him, but you know how dementia is. You have good days, you have bad days. And so when I had FaceTime with him, I didn't see this stuff, but it's clear he's in mental decline. She could go even further, you might say, and say, I, oh, look, I'm the vice president. I'm not the president. I don't really, I, I don't have much to do with this administration. It's not like I was in all of these meetings with him, but she can't do that for two reasons. One, she's not qualified to be president. So her, her chief qualification to be president is she can say, I'm the vice president. I've been doing a lot. Joe's imbued me with presidential authority on the border and on connecting rural Americans to high-speed internet, both of which I totally failed at. But whatever she say, I, I, I'm in the room. I'm a decider. I was the last person in the room with Biden when he decided on the botched pullout from Afghanistan. All the particular examples make her look bad. But the, but the idea that she's been really involved in this administration is the only reason she can even semi-plausibly say with a straight face that she's ready to be president. So she can't run away from the policies of Biden, even though politically it might help her because the Biden policies have failed and they're very unpopular with people on, on virtually every front other than maybe abortion. But on all, all the real big issues that people care about, the economy, migration, foreign policy, you name it, 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 Biden and Harris are underwater. So she can't run away from it for that reason. The other reason she can't run, a, run away from Biden is but Biden already hates her. <laughs> Biden is already undermining her campaign. When Joe Biden comes out and says, yeah, I've been talking to Ron DeSantis. He's doing a great job handling this hurricane. That undermines Kamala Harris, who was whining that DeSantis wouldn't take her call. And then DeSantis says, why would I take her call? She's not the president. I'm talking to the president. Joe Biden backs up who? His vice president? Does he back up Kamala? No, he backs up DeSantis. Biden already hates her for replacing him and for launching a presidential campaign in 2020 by calling him a racist. So Kamala's in this tough position. She's got to remain a little bit on Joe's good side because Joe Biden still wields some power in the Democrat Party. So she's just trapped. She has no answer on anything. I mean, this isn't just on the relationships of the Democrat Party. You see this on policy too. Kamala was asked a question about the border wall. And she was asked this question on CNN by Anderson Cooper. The, the border wall uh, was a big issue in 2020 when she was running for president. And, and she said the border wall was a terrible idea, really dumb, really stupid. She mocked it. But then she came out and supported policies that would build a border wall, in part because the wall worked and the migration crisis was, was so out of control under Biden and Harris that they had to do something to stop the bleeding of their political support. So Anderson Cooper, again, to his credit on CNN, asks Kamala about her, her contradiction on the border wall. Here's her non-answer. Under Donald Trump, you criticized the wall more than 50 times. You called it stupid, useless, and a medieval vanity project. Is a border wall stupid? Well, let's talk about Donald Trump and that border wall. <laughs> so remember Donald Trump said Mexico would pay for it? Come on, they didn't. How much of that wall did he build? I think the last number I saw is about 2%. And then when it came for time for him to do a photo op, you know where he mm. did it? In the part of the wall that President Obama built. But you're agreeing so, to a bill on. that would earmark $650 million <laughs> to continue building that we, wall. I, I pledge that I am going to bring forward that bipartisan bill. To fix the problem, you're, you're doing this compromise bill. It does call for $650 million that was earmarked under Trump to actually still go to build the wall. I'm not afraid of good ideas where they occur. You know, so you don't think it's stupid anymore? I think what he did and how he did it did, was, did not make much sense because he actually didn't do much of anything. I just talk, talked about that wall, right? We just talked about it. He didn't actually do much of anything. But you do want to build some wall. I want to strengthen our border. The wall is a bad idea. It's a dumb, medieval, stupid. It's a bad idea. Anderson Cooper. Okay, but you, you support allocating funds to build the wall, even though that was, that was a Trump policy. Well, yeah, I'm not afraid of good ideas wherever I can get them. So you think the Trump border proposal is a good idea? No, Trump's, Trump's 
uh, proposal is a bad idea. But you support it now. You support the wall. Yeah, it was, his was bad because he didn't build enough of the wall. Okay, so you want to build more of the wall. I support, I support the border. <laughs> she's running. She's trying to run to the right of Trump. He didn't build that wall big enough. He didn't build that wall wide enough. By the way, she picked a running mate who said that if, if Republicans build a 25-foot wall, that he's going to build a 30-foot ladder factory to get over the wall. But now she's running to the right of Trump on the wall. She says, yeah, the worst part about it, he didn't even build that wall big enough, that big dumb wall, but now it's good. And he didn't, he should have built more of a wall. But then she's trying to run to the left of centrist Dems without ever explicitly saying, I support the wall. She won't answer it. He, Anderson Cooper presses her on it multiple times. She said, oh, I, I support, I like <laughs> security or whatever. This is proof positive. If you stand in the middle of the road, you will be hit by a truck, guaranteed in the long run. She would be much better off right now if she said, I support border security, I don't support a wall. It it would be hard to explain why that is because walls obviously work, but she would be much better off if she said that. Or if she said, no human being is illegal. What Trump did is unconscionable. It's cruel, it's evil. I don't support it. I support, and then she could make up some other ridiculous pseudo policy to deal with illegal immigration. She'd be better off in that case. She'd probably be better off if she said, I I support open borders. Maybe, maybe not. But at least a little bit of clarity here would, would give people the impression that this woman is not just completely confused and incompetent, constantly contradicting herself, even within the same breath. Really weak stuff. So because the Democrats have nothing They have nothing at this point in the campaign. They have got to go back to the old playbook. So they found some lady (laughs) that no one's ever heard of who is going to claim that 31 years ago, Donald Trump made a pass at her. Before we get to that story, though, I want to tell you about Hallow. Go to hallow.com slash Knowles. If you need help in your prayer life, it is time to check out Hallow, the number one Christian prayer and meditation app. Hallow has thousands of prayers, meditations, resources, and incredible spiritual leaders. Now... They're starting a new prayer challenge on C.S. Lewis's most popular book, a very important book to my reversion to the faith. That would be Mere Christianity. Every day, the series will go through a passage, reflect on it, and enter into a time of prayer. Plus, Hallow has some great content for election week to help keep us safe and sane. I am sure that that will be very helpful. Download Hallow for three months free, hallow.com slash Knowles. Download the app for free. Join the challenge at hallow.com slash Knowles, Canada W L E S. Hello.com slash Knowles. You will get an exclusive three-month free trial of all 10,000 plus prayers and meditations. If you want to be happy and do what you're obligated to do, which is pray to God, but also if you just want to be happy and have a good life, you ought to endeavor for holiness. If you want to be holy, you got to pray. Go right now. If you're having a little trouble in your prayer life, hello.com slash Knowles, Canada, W-L-E-S. Even if you're not having trouble, get an exclusive three-month trial, hello.com slash Knowles. My favorite comment yesterday is from Henry Biaman, 8431, who says, don't forget about the silent Trump voters. These are the people who say they love Kamala, but secretly vote for Trump. It's a small group. They're called the Biden family. So true. So true. I wouldn't be surprised if Hunter voted for Trump at this point. Dems are going back to the old playbook. They found a lady, another lady who says that 31 years ago, the early ni- in 1993, Donald Trump sexually harassed her. Uh, I'm, I'm making fun of this story because I don't believe her. But I, I do take stories like this somewhat seriously. I know a, a lot of uh, people just write off the whole Me Too movement. I, I actually do think that men can be predators. And I, I do think a lot of women's stories, especially coming out of Hollywood, are true. It's worth pointing out that most of the men involved were are left-wing Democrats who who are at the height of sectors that are totally controlled by the libs. But even putting that aside, Republican men can do it too. Conservative men can do it too. Uh, so I, I don't reject the claims of sexual harassment totally out of hand. I think there are reasons that women don't come forward for periods of time. I think they can be embarrassed. I think they're afraid of reprisal. So I actually, I, I'm fairly moderate on the, on this sort of issue. On this woman's claims, I think there are some holes in her story 
some, at, some reasons at least, not to find her credible. Here she is in her own words. When Jeffrey looked at me and said, you know, let's go stop by and see Trump. And so we went to Trump Tower and went up the elevator. And moments later, Trump was greeting us. And he pulled me into him and started groping me. He put his hands all over my breasts. My waist, my butt. And I froze. And I froze because I was so deeply confused about what was happening because the hands were moving all over me. Yet these two men were like smiling at one another and continuing on in their conversation. That is why I am here tonight. I figured it was time to share this. And I am ready to win this election. The thought of that monster being back in the White House is my absolute worst nightmare. So thank you very much. The thought of that monster being back in the White House is my absolute worst nightmare. That's the line. That's the big hole in her story. Yes, this, these, this allegedly took place decades ago. That's a red flag. Yes, the only witness that she mentions here is a guy who quite famously is dead. <laughs> so dead men tell no tales. Like, uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no proof of this whatsoever. Uh, but, but really the big hole in her story is right there. The thought of that man being back in the White House is my worst nightmare. Okay, then why didn't you come out in 2020? Why didn't you come out in 1994? That's one question. Or 93, I guess when it was. But okay, you didn't want to. You moved on. You put it out of your mind. The Jeffrey she's talking about here is Jeffrey Epstein, by the way. I think most people picked up on that. But okay, you were hanging around some dodgy, dodgy people. Okay. I can even understand why in 2016 you might not come forward. Oh, we don't think Trump's going to win. Oh, it's no big deal. Even if this really happened, you know, he's not going to he's not going to be president. All the smart models are saying 99% chance Hillary gets elected. Okay. Oh, wow, we were all so surprised when Trump won. But 2020, he he looked pretty good. Obviously, the Democrats changed all the election rules, so the it was difficult to predict exactly what would happen, but Trump looked pretty good. By the old election rules, he would have won almost certainly. Why wouldn't you come out then when there was such a risk of Trump getting reelected? This is my worst nightmare. Why not come out then? Why not come out earlier in this cycle when Trump was looking pretty good? Why not come out after the first debate with Biden when Biden collapsed? Why wait until a dozen days before the election without any proof, any evidence really of your claims? I mean, this woman makes Christine Blasey Ford look credible. Christine Blasey Ford came out. Remember, she was Kavanaugh's accuser. Even though she had no proof that any of this stuff happened, it was decades prior. The eyewitnesses who were there contradicted her. Even her friends, even her supporters contradicted her. This woman, all we know about her is that she was a model in the 90s. She claims to have dated Jeffrey Epstein, not a good sign. And she very actively campaigned for Barack Obama. Once again, you could say, well, actually, it was the predations of people like Donald Trump that led her into political activism. No, you can't say that because she was actively campaigning for Obama long before Trump was a serious figure on the political scene. Then she announces this on a Kamala Harris campaign call. Not very credible stuff, folks. This is the best Kamala's got. It, this, is, this is just like her whole campaign. It, it, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's so shocking and it, yeah, oh, well, you trot out some woman who without any evidence claims that, you know, some, a, a guy did something to her. No, it's just not even effective. They're not, just like the rest of the Kamala campaign, even this October surprise, it's not even competently done. So, okay, that doesn't work. Now they're going back to the well. They're trying celebrity endorsements. Uh, and, and what's their big celeb endorsement? A lot of celebs have sat on the sidelines or uh, given only mild support. So, all right, they got to really dig, dig back. We're going back to the 90s, folks. Going back to the 90s for the sexual harassment accusers. And we're going back to the 90s for the celeb endorsements. They get one from Michael Keaton. Hey, hi, Michael. You know, for some of you folks who, uh, guys mostly, I guess, who are thinking about attending a rally with Musk and, and, and Trump, um, they don't really respect you 
They laugh at you behind your back. They think you're stupid. They don't want to hang out with you. They have nothing in common with you. They're not your bros. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, when, when Trump, years ago, I guess, said, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and that'd still vote for me, basically what he's saying in parentheses is, these people are so stupid, they're so dumb, they'd still vote for me. They have no respect for you. Trust me. Okay. They, these, these, these Republicans, they, don't, they, have, they have nothing in common with you. I have a lot in common with you, working man. I, Michael Keaton, who have been a very rich, very famous Hollywood celebrity for decades. Hi, it's coming to you from sunny Southern California. I'm your bro. That's me. How do you do, fellow poor men? I'm, yeah, I don't think so. Win Handman, the great acting teacher, observed that to be an actor, to be a good actor, you have to be a gullible fool. You, meaning you need to be suggestible. You need to be able to give yourself to the imaginary circumstances and live truthfully within them. Uh, I, I, think, I think Michael Keaton's a good actor. Let's put it that way. And I don't think that's going to move a lot. You know what kind of endorsements I think will move people? The kind of endorsements Republicans are getting right now. Republicans in Pennsylvania are focusing through two chief Republican surrogates, J.D. Vance and RFK, specifically for the Catholic vote. Here is Bobby Kennedy, who, albeit uh, perhaps a less observant Catholic uh, for a lot, of, a lot of times, though he did uh, attend the church that I was baptized in. My grandmother went to the church that Bobby Kennedy would go to for 60 years. So, you know, he actually does come around the church sometimes. Uh, here's Bobby Kennedy's ad targeting Catholics in Pennsylvania. My Catholicism provided the foundation for a lifetime of striving to perfect my personal relationship with God. Two features of Catholicism are the notions of original sin and the concept of a forgiving God. Our job is to strive to perfect ourselves through conscious contact with our Creator, knowing that in human form, we're never going to achieve perfection. We'll always slip, but each time we get to get up and strive again. The same is true for America. Even when we don't live up to our national ideals, we get to remedy our shortfalls through unified action. That hope has led me to support Donald Trump. President Trump has promised to take bold action on our economy, on the border, and on restoring children's health. The Democratic Party has become the party of war, censorship, and corruption. Catholics may disagree on many issues, but we must find a way to love our children more than we hate each other. I hope you'll join me in supporting Donald Trump. Great, great ad. Really good ad with Kennedy. And in a way, it's it's helpful for, for a lot of people, I think, listening to this ad, that that. RFK is not a, a super trad, totally observant Catholic. He's like a lot of people. Catholicism is a sticky identity from, from the perspective of politics. So I'm Catholic, but you know, I don't always go to church. I don't always avail myself of the sacraments. They should. It's good. You, you should do that. You know, going to Mass is an obligation on Sunday, and you must avail yourself of the sacraments. And all. But what I'm saying is Kennedy is meeting a lot of people where they are. J.D. Vance just came out. He had an op-ed. Also, I think it's in the Pittsburgh Tribune, something like that. Uh, Kamala Harris's prejudice against Catholics, pointing out all of the, the attacks and insults that Kamala's made on Catholics. Why focus on Catholics? Because one in four voters in Pennsylvania is Catholic. And the Kamala campaign, in its brilliance, has decided to do everything that it can to offend Catholics in the final weeks of the campaign. To say there won't be religious exemptions. They're going to force Christian doctors to perform abortions against their conscience, to, to mock the, whole, the Blessed Sacrament in that Gretchen Whitmer video with the Doritos. You remember that? The governor of Michigan. So they're focusing and they're saying, okay, Trump is doing, doing much better among black men, according to the polls. Kamala's really losing support among black men. That's interesting. Trump doing much better among Hispanics, doing pretty well among Arabs. And, and Muslims broadly in places like Michigan, now doing well among Catholics. Catholics had, had leaned Democrat for a long time. Now we got a Catholic VP. We got a Catholic top surrogate in Bobby Kennedy. Wow. Maybe you're seeing more evidence of an even fuller political realignment. It's going to really hinge on Pennsylvania, which is a crucial state. I mentioned at the top of the show that people, this is, this is uh, follows from the previous topic, that people are being arrested for praying in their head in the UK. And that's true. We don't have time to get to that story right now. So, you know, I'm a tease. We'll have to get to it next week. Mark your calendars for next week, for Monday, folks, because Am I Racist is finally streaming exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. Here's the deal. You need to be a Daily Wire Plus member to watch it. If you've not joined yet, 
Now is the time. Go to Daily Wire Plus, sign up. Use code DEI for 35% off a new annual membership. Do not miss the movie, the bonus scenes, the inside scoop from Matt Walsh himself. Join Daily Wire Plus today. Be the first to stream Am I Racist this Monday. That is Monday, only on Daily Wire Plus. Get in now, and you can be one of the first to laugh at home with the number one documentary of the decade. Finally, finally, we've arrived at my favorite time of the week when I get to hear from you in the mailbag. The mailbag is sponsored by Pure Talk. Go to puretalk.com slash Knowles, K-N-W-L-E-S. Switch to a qualifying plan. Get one year free of Daily Wire Plus. Insider, take it away. Hi, Mr. Knowles. My name is Abby, and I'm 15. I've been listening to your show for almost two years now. My question has to do with how dating should be handled at my age. I met a guy through my homeschool co-op last year that I really enjoy spending time with. He's 16 and a Christian, which is the number one requirement on my list, and he loves to read just like me. We've even been swapping books with each other over the last year. Last week, he expressed that he has feelings for me and would love to ask me out. He didn't speak up sooner because he didn't know if I would be allowed to. I said I would absolutely love it, but my parents are against dating at a young age and want me to wait at least for another year. How should I go about my friendship with him now because I don't think there's any going back to being just friends after what he said? And how can I maybe convince my parents to let me date him or at least spend more time with him sooner? Thank you so much. Love the show. That's very sweet. That's really sweet. Especially, you know, sweet little Elisa and I uh, started dating when I was 16 and my much younger child bride was 15 and a half. So uh, I think it's really great. Uh, and I think your parents are right that you, you want to make sure there are real limits set on dating as teenagers. That part is important too. But you are dating is the thing. The fact that you're speaking this way with him and you're exchanging books, or I mean, it's really nice. Compared to modern dating, this is really sweet and wholesome. So you are dating. The question is, what kind of limits will be set on that? Um, probably it would be imprudent for your parents to totally, well, it pro- probably it would just, just be uh, ill-advised to stamp out this young love. I mean, it seems like you're, uh, he seems like a nice guy, uh, but also imprudent because uh, you, you'll, you're still going to like each other and you're still probably going to talk to each other in some way. And so, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not really possible to, to totally stamp that out. You just want to set the proper limits so that you guys aren't going up to, you know, neck up at, uh, you know, Romance Point and your, you know, Chevy or I don't know. I'm, this is like scenes out of Happy Days or something. But you want to make sure that you're uh, doing this. You, you are dating in an appropriate way uh, that is appropriate both from your age and from the perspective of morality. I mean, it, but it, also you didn't meet this guy like Roland CeeLo behind the... <laughs> You know, behind the club uh, downtown or something. You met this guy at a homeschool co-op. So he probably would would wish for the same thing. So I would just, I would speak openly to your parents about this. I, I not to sound too much like a lib, but I, I do favor relatively open communication uh, and, and make clear your point. You know, you don't want to be doing anything that's untoward or inappropriate uh, for your age or your, your station. Uh, but you, you know, you like the boy and he's a nice boy. And so, I don't know, you know, maybe... Uh, have your parents uh, invite the kid over for dinner or something like that. Seems nice. Also, because you're not, it's not like you're 12 and 13 here. You know, you're 15 and 16. Pretty soon you're going to be 16 and 17. Pretty soon you'll be 17 and 18. And then, you know, now you're, now you're almost adults. So that, that's what I would do. Because young love can really be beautiful. My, my grandparents were, they dated in high school, probably around 15, 16. And uh, they were married for almost 70 years before my grandfather died. So uh, anyway, I think uh, that, could, that could be great. Just set the right right boundaries on it. Next question. There's something the polling is suggesting that I'd like your take on and perhaps a clarification. The polls are showing, as they have for a while, that women are up for Harris and down for Trump. But contrary to what people might think, the polls are also showing that likely female voters care more about the economy than they care about abortion. Although they care about both uh, quite heavily, they care more about the economy. Since the economy is an issue that undercuts Harris's administration and Joe Biden's administration, and this is plain to see, um, wouldn't that suggest that women should be up for Trump? So how do you square those two things? Thanks. Well, they're lying or gaslighting themselves (laughs) is the only way to to explain it. For some of the women who say the economy is really the most important issue for them, but but they're going to vote for Kamala, who's completely destroyed the economy over, over Trump, either they're just really willfully, woefully ignorant about the economy, or they just recognize that it's, it's unseemly to say that your top political issue is 
the ability to murder babies. You know, I think even people who support legal abortion recognize that's a little unseemly. It makes it, it makes it appear that you have a real fanatical bloodlust for infants. And so you might say, no, it's, it's on my list. I, of course, support women's rights to do these things, but I really care about the economy. You know, to say the economy is that your top issues is to make one seem very serious and moderate. And, but, but obviously they, they don't really mean it if they're going to continue to vote for Kamala. So I think they're, they're gaslighting themselves. And I think women broadly gaslight themselves. I was speaking with a young woman, pro-life woman, who pointed out that, that women on the issue of abortion, they, they just kind of gaslight themselves. They, they know, especially if a woman's been pregnant, they know it's a baby. It's a baby. You know, it's not, <laughs> can we be blunt, just us gals here talking, it's a baby, obviously. What do you think it is? It's a duck? You think it's a telephone? No, it's a baby that's inside of you. And abortion kills a baby. That's all it does. I, what else could abortion possibly do? That's why they use all sorts of euphemisms about it, you know, reproductive freedom. And, but it's just, they're just gaslighting themselves because they want the license to do that because being pregnant is very scary, even for pro-life women, even for women with a lot of kids. Be, getting pregnant is very, very scary. But, so they, they want the ability to kill their baby, but they don't want to acknowledge that because it's ghastly and obviously evil. So they just, they just kind of gaslight themselves. And I think that's probably what's going on with the, with the women who say, no, 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 I, I care much more about the economy than the license to murder babies, but uh, I'm going to vote for Kamala anyway. Don't ask me why. That's why. Next question. Hey, Mike, recently on your show, you said that Jerry Seinfeld was right for recanting his assertion that wokeness is ruining comedy. And you have agreed with him because comedians have always had to change their material to fit the current cultural climate. And I agree with you on this, but here's the problem. I'm a consumer. So as a consumer, I can tell that the content is worse. And I remember a time when the content was funnier. And I'm pretty sure I'm not looking at the past through rose-colored glasses because every time I tune into a comedy podcast and I hear those PC comedians talk about this, they insist with more passion and fervor than any missionary I've ever met that com comedy has only gotten yeah. better. And they are protesting about this so heavily that I just know that it's not true. Uh, anyway, what are your thoughts? Thanks. Good question. You're, you're just a little off in your premise. I agree with Seinfeld that he should stop complaining about how the left has destroyed comedy. That's what he said. He said, you know, look, it's like a, like a skier. You got to make the gate. Okay. There's no excuses. You just got to keep up with the culture. So that's why I'm, and, and then as part of that, he recanted. He said, I'm not saying the left destroyed comedy. Forget about that. I recant it. Even that was kind of a joke, I think, that he was telling. Uh, so no, I, I think it's good I think he's right not to make excuses and to just try to make the gate. You know, you got to you got to play in politics in the reality that you're in. But the left certainly has destroyed comedy because they're humorless and divorced from reality. So that that of course is true. But but nevertheless, you can either whine about it and be taken out of the game, which is what Seinfeld was saying he did not want to do, or you can make the best with what you've got, which is what we're all called upon to do in politics, which is sometimes described as the art of the second best. Next question. Hey, Michael, Benji here. Big fan of the show, but I have a question. As a conservative evangelical, I have been raised by my parents, my church, and my seminary to be deep in history. And when I read history, I see that as a Protestant, I am under an anathema from the Second Council of Constantinople, the Lateran Council, the Second Council of Nicaea, the Ecumenical Council of Florence, all the anathemas at Trent, Papal Bull and Ephibilis Deus, the First Vatican Council, and Munificitessimus Deus. But then, when I read Vatican II, we Protestants are called separated brethren, part of ecclesial communities. How can I be called a brother in the Lord when I am under so many anathemas? And don't tell me anathema doesn't mean separated from God. That is what the Koine Greek means, how the medieval church defined it, and to deny that is to use the same postmodern hermeneutics the Libs used on the Second Amendment. But how can I be a brother in the Lord when I am under so many anathemas? Okay, well, that's a really, really good question. Uh, however, I think you've anticipated my answer by trying to get me not to give the answer, which is that anathema is, uh, well, put, putting aside its etymology for, for a moment, was a juridical term within the Catholic Church that, that pertained to the episcopate. So uh, an anathema is a, a punishment inflicted uh, upon a, a member of the church by a bishop, and so you mention when you mention councils that occurred before the Protestant Revolution. Notice you were you were mentioning councils from the 15th century or earlier. Uh, the, how how is it possible that you, at, for being a Protestant, 
would be considered anathema uh, in councils that predate the Protestant Revolution, that predate Martin Luther. Well, because you're saying because you have certain ideas, right. But the, the anathema would, would apply, as it applies just in practice, to Catholics. And it's a, a form of excommunication. It's not even really in the Code of Canon Law anymore. Uh, so uh, that's why, because you're not under the jurisdiction of a bishop, uh, and uh, uh, and it's it's just not not in effect in the Catholic Church. Uh, so how are you a brethren, uh, uh, one of the brethren in Christ, albeit separated? Well, because you profess belief in Christ, you have some kind of faith in Christ, uh, but you're separated in that. Obviously, you're separated from the church, but but also. Uh, you you do not have access to the sacraments, which would you know. You, so so sometimes Catholics describe it as uh, you know, wishing that uh, and praying that one comes into the fullness of truth. If someone someone on a desert island somewhere could hear the name of Christ and say, "Wow, I believe in Christ. I have faith in Christ." There's an aspect of truth there, a lot of truth, but it's not the fullness of truth because our Lord gives us a church and gives us uh, sacraments and uh, gives us uh, tools to grow with Him. And in him. So uh, anyway, that, that's, that's why. And I, but I think you anticipated my answer a little bit by saying, don't tell me that, you know, anathema is a, a juridical term and procedure within the Catholic Church that, you know, it, it does not even exist, you know, in the present code of canon law. Well, no, that is what it is. That, that is why. It's uh, something that would be applied to Catholics. You, however, would say, you would say, I'm not, I'm not a Catholic. Okay, wouldn't apply. Though it'd be great if you did become a Catholic. So if you're interested, you know, Maybe uh, write in again to the mailbag. Okay, it's Fake Headline Friday. The rest of the show continues now. You don't want to miss it. Become a member. Use code Knowles, K-N-O-W-L-E-S, at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. The question everyone in America is asking, Am I? Racist. Make those moves. Get a Daily Wire Plus membership <laughs> to see Am I Racist? This is all I have. Did you did you want to I can help you guys out? Yeah. Go to amiracist.com and sign up now. I've been told because I'm a white male kind of at the top of the pile. How do I get down from the top? I don't think you necessarily can. <laughs> We get past all the uh, talk about racism. We have to love each other. Well, it can't be that simple. How do we get to a point of racial harmony? Good to talk to you. Mm-hmm. We're still on a journey, all of us together. I think you got right. some journey in to do. Just talk to me about the statistics. We have the epidemic. 20 million crimes a year, 6,000, 7,000 hate crimes. No, there's no epidemic. Why are we talking about statistics? This is not a, a matter of statistics. Well, we, you asked me about the statistics. Am I Racist? Coming to Daily Wire Plus on October 28th. Rated PG-13.